There they are. Three miles left, 10 o'clock. I don't think they see us yet. Okay, I see them. Left, 10 o'clock, level, continue left turn. Good morning, gentlemen. The temperature is 110 degrees. Holy sh Viper! Viper's up here, great! Hello again everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video we're going to be taking a look at the Heat Blur India Fox Teco F14 Tomcat. This one for me and I think for many of you was a highly anticipated rather exciting potential addition to the sim. For many of you who are solely Microsoft Flight Simulator users I'm sure that many of you will be familiar with India Fox Teco, the dev having created aircraft such as the MB339, the F35 Lightning. Heat Blur, on the other hand, if you're a DCS user, I'm sure need absolutely no introduction. They are undoubtedly masters of their craft within DCS, creating some of my favourite add-ons within that particular sim, including the Vigan and the legendary F-14 Tomcat. Of course, DCS is a sim known for its high fidelity modules, its advanced flight modelling, and generally speaking, the quality of the add-ons within DCS are consistently higher at least than any other sim. So again, I think that many of us were particularly excited for this release. It'd be very interesting to see what Heat Blur and Indian Fox Teco can manage within Microsoft Flight Simulator. As usual, in today's video, we're going to be running through a full flight, and I think it's fair to say this is a pretty special one. We're currently on the ground at Fighter Town, USA. It's the 1980s. We find ourselves at Naval Air Station Miramar, also home, of course, to Top Gun. Objectively, I think we can all agree that everything was better back in the 80s, so we've transported ourselves back in time we're going to be running through more or less a full startup here in the Tomcat. We'll run through all of the procedures as per the checklist. We'll then be making a two ship formation flight out towards East Miramar for a little bit of maneuvering before positioning back onto the deck of the USS Forrestal for our landing. Once we are safely back down on the deck, as per usual, we'll finish up the video with a conclusion of what I think of the product. As always, I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you do, then please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. So welcome then to what is a little bit of a trip back in time really. Welcome to Naval Air Station Miramar and welcome to the visually stunning cockpit of the Heat Blur India Fox Teco F-14. I'm sure that many of you will agree that in terms of visual fidelity the aircraft is pretty much second to none. It is very hard to remember an aircraft that looks this good either in Microsoft Flight Simulator or indeed in any other sim. And certainly in terms of graphics the aircraft does have its DCS counterpart beat. Although, of course, in terms of system fidelity, the DCS version of the Tomcat is going to win every time. That being said, you still get a pretty detailed, pretty realistic rendition of the F-14 within Microsoft Flight Simulator overall. And obviously, I'll be aiming to demonstrate that to you here today. You'll notice it's already pretty noisy on board the Tomcat. There's no battery or APU fitted to the aircraft, so we've got an external power cart down there on the right. And a ground air cart connected to the aircraft with the start down there on the left. We are going to be running through a full startup, or at least most of it. We may cut out some of the checks during the process as it's fairly laborious and very lengthy startup overall. It would eat up a lot of the video. We don't really have to work through things on our own. We have Jester. He's buried away down the back and he's going to be helping us work through our checklists. As with the DCS version of the aircraft then, we do have the Jester menu, albeit somewhat simplified of course, and just using the mouse here to activate the menu options. So again, we're going to be using an assisted start. It's going to be a voice-assisted, shore-based start. We'll select the option. For the ICS comm check, coming down to the comm panel, the ICS switch set through to hot mic. We'll have a quick word with Jester, let him know that we're reading him loud and clear. And just a little bit of a pause here, and then we'll move on with the startup process. Hey, man, you good? All right, check landing gear indication extended and transition light off. Landing gear handle is selected down, gear indication is down and transition light is out. Okay, next, select LTS on master test switch and verify all lights illuminate. Okay, carry out a lights test. The rotary selector for the master test switch is in the reverse sense of your mouse wheel operation, which is a little bit strange. Then select fire DEP EXP on master test selector and verify left and right fire and still lights illuminate. Okay, the lights test is good. We'll carry out the fire detection and extinguishing test. Select INFT on master test selector and verify that engine fuel, wind sweep, and alpha instruments are working. 
And we do have a go there on the fire test, through to the instrument test. Army and again, just working our way through the cockpit, the instruments look good. So the master test switch will take back through to the off position for now. To arm up the ejection seat, coming up to the top of the seat, you can see the arming pin will move that into the down position. Close the and we are clear to close up. You'll notice the internal sounds on the F-14 are really top-notch as well overall, a very high level of attention to detail. Canopy is closed and locked. Okay, so gun rate low, sidewinder call is off, missile prep's off, mode is set to normal. Okay, make sure emergency store jettison push button light is out. The emergency stores jettison push button light is out. Obviously not really applicable here in the sim, but we'll run through the checklists. Make sure ladder light is off. Down to the caution and warning panel, the ladder light is extinguished, expecting to see that. And that should now have us ready for the start. Okay, ready to start. So we are good for the start, the anti-collision light can go on. We'll get our start clearance from the ground chief. That air source to off. For the air source, that is selected off. Hydraulic transfer pump to off. And for the hydraulic transfer pump, the switch will actually automatically actuate once we unguard it, so a little bit of a concession for the sim, it's going to go straight through to shut off. Set emergency flight hydro to low and check for on flag in emergency flight low hydraulic pressure window. And same for the emergency flight hydraulics. Once we set that through to the unguarded position, the switch will automatically go through to low. We're just checking for the flag. Set emergency flight hydraulics to high and check for on flag in emergency flight high hydraulic pressure window. We'll set the switch through to high and again checking the flag, which we have. Set emergency flight hydro to auto. And guarding up the switch once again. So we should now be good for the start itself. Starting the right-hand engine first. Now engine crank switch to right. The right start switch will set through to crank. Right throttle to idle at 20% RPM. The throttles are modelled a little bit strangely. By default they're already in the idle position. If you want to go through to cut off, there's a click spot. But the operation of that's a little bit clunky. We'll take a look at that later on, of course. Check that right generator and right fuel pressure caution lights are off. Okay, there's 20%. We do have a light off. There's our fuel flow. And the fuel pressure and generator caution lights are extinguished now on the right. TRT is coming up. So TIT peaking there around 750 degrees. And checking the engine parameters, we've got a thousand pounds now there on the fuel flow, 600 degrees. We should see the engine stabilize around 70% on the RPM. Okay, we can now have the ground external power disconnected. We can do that via the gesture menu, but you can also assign a keybind, which I've done, so we'll use that. And now clear to crank the left engine. And once again, 1,000 pounds an hour on the left side, 600 degrees, just coming up on 70%. So parameters look good, we do have two good starts. Okay, for the air source, first onto the left engine. Next onto the right engine. 
and through to both. And back down to the hydraulic transfer pump, we can guard that up once again. For the AFCS, the stability augmentation channels will take the pitch, roll and your channels on. Master test switch through to emergency generator and we'll actuate the test. Okay, we do have a go light, we'll come back through to off. And once again, just confirming we do have all three stability augmentation channels selected on. Okay, wing sweep mode is set through to auto. Just hit the master reset. We do have auto indicated. And the wing's now travelling forwards. The wing external transfer switch is set off. Once again, hitting the master reset. For the UHF radio, we'll come through to both. And tack on through to transmit receive. Okay, hour eight sixty-three is set on. The displays, the VDI, HUD, and HSD selected on. And just checking the displays, everything looking good. Radio displays, I presume, is referring to the two radio selectors here up on the main instrument panel. They're checked. Okay, we'll take the rad out. That's just going to run through a warm up test. And for the trims, confirming there we do have trims set and indicating zero. The standby attitude indicator, that is set and checked. Once again we'll hit master reset. And back through to the master test switch, this time through for an OBC test. Autopilot master can go on. Okay, so we're going to extend the speed brakes partially initially, then retract them, then all the way through to fully extended, and then retract once again. There's full extension. We can extend the fuel probe. So again, very nice level of attention to detail and system depth on the aircraft overall, particularly for a Microsoft Flight Simulator aircraft. We can retract the probe once again. Okay, for the windshield we'll come through to the air position. And the OBC test is complete, we have a go light, we can disable that once again. Once again the wing external transfer switch is set through to off. And confirming again, trims are set and checked at zero. So at this point in the setup process, it is just several cycles really of the wing sweep and flap and slap position. Again, it's quite a lengthy process, not particularly interesting to watch. So we'll just briefly head outside the aircraft. You can see the wing and slap flap extension animations in their entirety. And we'll come back once that step's complete and continue on with the checks.
Okay, so we're just working our way through the ARA 63 bike test at the moment. We've just carried out the Takan bike test here as well. Also carried out the Radout bike test. And we've got the altimeter now set QNH 2974. The bike test does take some time to complete, so just waiting on that. And once again, we've got 2974. Just cycle the mode once again. Now, to set, showing 500 foot on the airdrome elevation or just below. Okay, for the headings, it's a bit of an interesting one. Showing about 115 on all three displays. But the magnetic compass showing due north, and that seems to be stuck. So, a little bit of a bug there, I think, at the moment. The magnetic compass doesn't seem to be working. Anyway, that's it in terms of our onboard checklist. Just a few more checks to run here before the taxi. So just to save myself for getting later on, we'll go through to auto on the wing external transfer switch. The lights, once again, are set as required. The anti-skid spoiler brake switch is selected off. It's obviously going to be a field departure, so we'll set the hook bypass switch through to the field position. No strut switch is selected off. For the HUD display mode, we are set through to takeoff. Parker brake will leave on just a little bit longer. And for the nose wheel steering push button, we have that selected already. So we are now finally ready for the taxi. We'll make our way right here out of the flight line. It's going to be a fairly long taxi here as we're making our way out towards runway 06 left. We're going to be making an easterly departure in a two-ship formation, heading out for some fun over East Miramar. 612, Courage departure radio check. 612, heavy lab clear. 99, BRC 280, altimeter 3003. 99, mother steady, BRC 270. 601, airborne. Okay, so we've now got ourselves lined up here on runway 06 left. We've got our wingman here out on the right of the aircraft. You can see the hills there off in the distance. Again, we're going to be making an easterly departure. We'll head out towards the hills. We'll have some fun. Throw the Tomcat around a little bit before we head off to the carrier. With this being an F-14A, I gather we're well within our rights to use the afterburners, so we're certainly going to be doing that here for the takeoff. Just confirming the part brake is off. We'll hold the aircraft on the brakes. And initially coming through to 90% here on the RPM. Engines look good. Off the brakes, into the afterburner detents. And that giving the Tomcat a big kick up the backside. The airspeed building up to 100 knots, looking to rotate at 130. There's 130, so back on the stick. Overall, the aircraft actually feels pretty good there during the takeoff. Nothing too untowards. We do have positive climb, so we'll bring in the gear. Run up two, doing the same there as well. We'll get the flaps up. So it's climbing away straight ahead. Up through 300 knots. We'll keep the afterburners until 500 on the speed. So it's trimming accordingly, up through 400 knots, the Tomcat barely breaking a sweat. And our wingman there maintaining station at our 2 o'clock position. Okay, it's 500. Come back out of the afterburners. And in terms of our fuel state, 7,700 pounds now on board the aircraft. Bingo fuel before we head off towards the carrier is 4,000 pounds, so we've got about another 3,700 here to play with over the hills. We're just going to continue tracking out towards the northeast. We'll be initially tracking over the San Vicente Lake. And once we hit that, we'll begin our maneuvering. Okay, so we're just approaching the San Vicente Lake, that's down at our 11 o'clock, and so far I've got to say, so good with the heat blur Indy Fox Tech F14. We'll roll in, we'll go low level, we're going to come over the lake and then make a bit of a right hand circuit here around the hills, back out towards the Alcon Reservoir, which is off at our 2 o'clock currently. We'll take the afterburners in again, 
You can ignore the animations here on the wingmen throughout the flight. Unfortunately, they don't pick up correctly with the flight recording tool that I'm using. So his wings are going to remain swept and no afterburner animations for him. Up through 600 knots already on the speed. Tracking out towards the northeast. Okay, 7,000 pounds, so 3,000 pounds above bingo fuel. We'll come off the afterburners again. I've got to say, overall, I really like the way the aircraft actually flies. Certainly for a fast jet in Microsoft Flight Simulator, the flight model is very good. One of the best flight models with a sim for any fast jet, although that's not necessarily saying a whole lot. It tends to be that flight models within the sim are rather lacklustre when it comes to these sorts of aircraft. So we'll pull some high G there. You can see a nice amount of buffeting. Excellent vapour effects there as well as we come over the Elcon Reservoir. And just bring the aircraft around through the roll. So tracking now out towards the south. Our wingman should be off our 9 o'clock. There he is. Yeah, so as I say, the flight model, definitely one of India Fox Teco's better efforts in the sim. I have been a little bit critical of some of their flight models previously, particularly the uh, T-45. didn't particularly like the way that aircraft felt to fly. But this feels really good. It's certainly very enjoyable. It's obviously not as detailed and as finessed as the DCS version of the aircraft, but still very nice overall. Very enjoyable to fly. It doesn't feel quite as alive at high angles of attack and high G. I think that's to be expected. But you do get that buffeting, which is great. Don't see that from too many aircraft. And if we really just keep pulling the aircraft around, bleeding off that speed. Good rate of turn there as well initially, but you can see we will ultimately snap a wing. So the Tomcat will bite if you continue to pull back on the stick and let that speed bleed off. Down now to 6,000 pounds on the fuel. If you go full deflection out to the right there, again, pretty decent roll rate overall. I've noticed that roll rate doesn't seem to change all that much with speed. We're doing 400 knots currently. We picked speed back up to around 600 knots. So afterburners in again. And wingman now off to our 4 o'clock position. It's up through 500, there's 550. Approaching Mach 1. Uh, maybe that roll rate has slowed down just a little bit there actually, so that's good to see as well. Coming up through the speed of sound, you do get a little bit of a tuck there as I say. Back pressure needed now to maintain our present attitude, so that's good to see as well. And again, just to pull some more G here, all the way back on the stick. A little bit of pogoing there as we come around the corner at high speed, but we are up through 400, 500 knots, and I can feel the wing there wanting to snap. And now that we've pulled all that G blood off that speed, the wing's extending as well, of course. So we'll head back in towards the hills. We'll just do one more low-level run, and then we'll make our way up towards the carrier. Got uh, 4,600 pounds now, so really not a whole lot of fuel to play with. But bingo fuel. So we'll come back out of the afterburners. No need to be burning that fuel off any faster than we have to. And still getting a very respectable speed here out of the Tomcat. 450 knots here in the dive. So again, the flight model, it's always quite hard to quantify flight models, at least for me, but I think the flight modeling holds up very well versus most other fast jets in the sim. Again, doesn't hold a candle necessarily to the DCS Tomcat, but nor were we expecting it to in reality. The aircraft though is very enjoyable to fly, it feels very tight, very responsive, very reasonable on the controls. It just again doesn't feel quite as live at high angles of attack, high G, you don't get quite as much buffeting and shaking as you do in DCS, and you don't feel as though you're on a knife edge quite as much while flying the aircraft as I typically tend to find with the Tomcat in DCS. So back down the Elcon Reservoir and 4,300 pounds of fuel now, I think it's a good time to make our way out towards the west, we'll head for the carrier. Hopefully that's given you a decent demonstration of the flight modelling at various ranges within the flight envelope. We'll obviously talk a bit more about the flight model towards the end of the video. And at this stage in the flight, essentially nothing too egregious that I've found that's worth reporting back home about. 
and we're hoping to get more of a feel for it as well during our carrier landing. Our wingman here is going to head back off towards Miramar. We're going to be making a solo run out towards the carrier. It's the USS Forrestal that we're headed for here today. A really nice addition with the package. We'll take more of a look at that in just a moment's time. For now though, we'll continue up to a more reasonable cruise altitude and I'll come back to you again as we make our approach towards the deck. 412, departure radar contact, one mile. Alright, that's 410. 410. 210, 210 approach, or correction, departure radar contact. 210, check in button 3. 410, check in button 3. 201, departure radar contact. Okay, so we've just come up and beam the carrier. Once again, it's the USS Forrestal, I believe, that's included with the package. And that's a really nice touch from India Fox Teco and Heat Blur Simulations. I would say a carrier is basically an essential to have with an F-14 in any sim. And I'm sure that many developers would have made the carrier a separate payware add-on. The detailing is actually pretty nice as well. It's period appropriate. You'll see more of the detail once we get ourselves down on the deck. We're just going to fly a very rough approximation here of an overhead brake. We're not going to worry too much about our parameters and we are going to fly a fairly nice wide downwind. We'll extend final as well, just to give ourselves plenty of time to get the aircraft configured. Myself not being all that familiar with carrier operations. So typically here we'd be cranking on some G to come around the corner and bleed off all that speed, but that's not necessary in this particular case. We're below 280 knots, so the wing sweep is set through to auto. Below 250, we can take the landing gear down. Keep around 1,500 foot for now. Again, typically I think we'd want around 800 feet, but we're going to be extending final. Now below 225 now, so we'll come through to landing flaps. We'll hold the DLC for now until we're established on final. And in terms of our fuel state, we've got 3,100 pounds. We've reset bingo fuel there to 2,000 pounds here for the landing. Okay, so nicely established on downwind, we'll get the aircraft trimmed out. And coming up on the power again to maintain 150 knots. We've already got the HUD here set through to landing. So we've got the flight path vector that's going to help us put the aircraft in the right zone here for the touchdown. And nice amount of distance now between us and the forest draw, so we'll start the turn inbound. We'll take the DLC. You can see there the lift up is deploying. And a little bit of buffet here as we get up towards some slightly higher angles of attack. We're now on target. Carry landing, of course, so we'll take the hook down. And just rolling out onto final. Definitely a little bit fast here at the moment. And we'll maintain around 150, that seems pretty comfortable in the sim. No, just about showing on target. I think we've actually got a little bit of a crosswind here out from the left, which is not helping. There aren't too many crosswind carry landings, I don't think, in the real world. A little bit of a limitation of the sim. Okay, reasonably well established. Just remembering not to flare the aircraft as we touch down. All the way through to full afterburner catching the wire and cutting the throttles. Okay, so we are now clear of the wire. We'll retract the tail hook. We'll select the nose while steering on. And we can retract the flaps here as well. Come back to manual for the wing sweep and we'll set the wings through to the oversweep position. Obviously that's going to have the wings retract once again, just allow us to maneuver a little bit more readily here on the deck without hitting anyone else. So we'll just hang her out to the right, we'll clear the deck and then we'll get ourselves parked out. We'll run through a bit of an abbreviated shutdown checklist. But again, as you can see, very nice detailing overall on the carrier, given that it's essentially freeware included with the product. And nice as well to have a period-appropriate carrier here with some F-14s 
parked up on the deck. So onto the brakes, we'll take the part brake on. We'll disarm the ejection seat. And I'm running through the shutdown checks. Firstly, electrical equipment. We'll just take everything off once again, so just working our way around the cockpit. We'll take the tacon off, UHF radio off. For the FCS, we'll take the stability augmentation switches off. Radar can go off. Take the HSD, the HUD, and the VDI off. Airway 63 is selected off. And we'll take the air conditioning source off once again. We'll open up the canopy. And for the shutdown, as I mentioned, pretty clunky overall. We just clicked the click spot here behind the throttles. And that'll cut both engines here at the same time. And we do have a good shutdown on the Tomcat. So there you go, guys. I do hope you enjoyed our outing in the heat blur India Fox Teco F14 Tomcat. I have to say that this add-on for me was a really pleasant surprise within the sim. I certainly had high hopes, but I have to say I was rather intrigued to see just how well the heat blur simulations F14 actually transferred into Microsoft Flight Simulator. Overall, this collaboration between the two devs, I think it's fair to say, has been an absolute triumph. I absolutely loved my time out in the aircraft, even more so than I was expecting to. Inevitably, comparisons are going to be drawn between this version of the aircraft and the DCS version of the F-14. I know that not all of you are going to agree with me on this, but I'm going to nip that in the bud a little bit ahead of time. The aircraft doesn't need to compete with the DCS version of the F-14. Microsoft Flight Simulator obviously isn't DCS, it has a very different user base. Both products have a lot to offer. If you want to explore the world and really take in the beauty of the F-14, then Microsoft Flight Simulator is probably the option for you. Of course, though, if you want highly accurate systems, weapons modeling, combat, then DCS is your best bet. Personally, I enjoy both sims for different reasons, and it is okay to enjoy more than one sim, so I think this product certainly has its place on the market. Anyway, as usual, I'll try and break the product down into some categories, give you what I like and don't like about the F-14. Starting with the modelling and texturing, again, we can keep that very short and sweet. It is some of the best modelling and texturing that I've seen for any aircraft in any sim. It sounds like I've been saying that a lot recently, and to be fair I have, but of course the quality within Microsoft Flight Simulator just keeps building as the sim matures. And once more, it's not a competition, but Heat Blur did a beautiful job with the F-14 and DCS. They've really built upon that in Microsoft Flight Simulator. As far as the flight model goes, that is a lot trickier for me to nail down. I've never flown aircraft representative of the F-14. The only thing I can compare this version with is of course the DCS F-14. And undoubtedly, the DCS aircraft does take the trophy there. The flight model does feel much more finessed, much more accurate within DCS. That is to be expected, and the devs are pretty upfront about that themselves. They do mention that there are certain limitations with using Microsoft Flight Simulator for this sort of aircraft. With that being said though, overall the aircraft actually flies very nicely. Given that it's a swept wing aircraft, a pretty complex airframe, capable of both shore and carrier operations, it wouldn't be at all surprising to me if the flight model had fallen well short within Microsoft Flight Simulator, and certainly that doesn't seem to be the case here. The aircraft felt reasonable during the taxi, although there was a little bit of a throttle detent there, it was quite hard to get the right power setting, you either came to a standstill or you picked up too much speed. The F-14 behaved very nicely during the takeoff, very reasonably as well I think there during our manoeuvring. Really great that you do get that buffeting, those vapour effects as well off the wing as you pull the G. As I mentioned during the flight itself, the airframe doesn't feel quite as alive as its DCS counterpart, particularly during that manoeuvring. But you do still get that buffeting, and as we saw, the F-14 will bite you if you let that speed bleed off too much during your manoeuvring. Landing felt good as well. Again, I'm no expert when it comes to carrier operations, but the aircraft was easy enough to control down the approach. Despite my best efforts, it seems I still put the aircraft into a little bit of a flare there, but the built-in arrestor gear seemed to work very nicely. The aircraft's performance seems broadly representative of what I would expect from the Tomcat, and all of the ancillary flight modeling systems as well, for example, the swept wing the DLC system all seem to be working quite nicely as well. As far as the aircraft systems go, again a little bit tricky to pin that one down, certainly the aircraft is very nicely modelled in terms of its system's depth, pretty much every switch in the cockpit is clickable. That being said though, not all of the switches do have associated systems effects. So given that and the fact that of course we don't have any weapon systems really modelled on the aircraft, there is basic radar functionality, but I don't think we can say this is a study level representation of the Tomcat. 
As you've seen though, during the fairly lengthy startup there, there is a lot of system steps to the aircraft, certainly more than enough to meet my own expectations and needs. I really enjoy diving into the aircraft systems. I think the gesture functionality as well, helping you run through the checklist is a great feature to have. I don't miss the weapon systems personally. And again, if you do, DCS is the better bet for you. Deployment of weapons is not modeled. However, there are visual representations of a typical F-14 loadout, as you'll have seen during the introduction and now here during the conclusion. Further to that, we also have basic radar modeled. You can pick up AI targets on the radar. So certainly, as far as a civilian sim goes, there is plenty of functionality available with the heat blower F-14. As far as the aircraft sounds go, again, very nicely done overall. I will say that the internal sounds, to my mind, slightly trump the external sounds. The internal sounds are excellent. There's not really much I can fault there either. Every switch, every control, every operation seem to have an associated sound. My only minor gripe really with the internal sounds, Jester is pretty hard to hear once you've got the engines running. It'd be nice to bump his sounds up a little bit, or perhaps have the option via the menu to select a sound setting for Jester. Externally, again, generally speaking, the sounds are very good. A little bit abrupt at times, the sound changes, for example, during the engine start. And you do get a nice roar from behind, but overall the Tomcat just doesn't quite have that sense of power that you would typically get from a DCS module. As far as the extras included with the product go, again, lots of good things to say there. Firstly, once again, we do have the visually modeled weapons, which is a nice touch. The same goes with the visually modeled ground equipment, the ground air start and ground power units, the chocks, the air intake covers. Beautifully modeled custom pilots as well. You'll have seen those a couple of times throughout the flight. That really goes to show just that extra level of attention to detail. Obviously, Heat Blur and India Fox Techo could have used the default Microsoft Flight Simulator pilot models. The Jester system as well, I think, well worthy of a mention. Again, not as much fidelity there as you'll see in DCS. But nevertheless, very nicely implemented and certainly helps to make the F-14 that much more accessible. You can have Jester help with things like starting up the aircraft, aligning the IRS, configuring the aircraft in general. You do also, of course, get two variants of the F-14 included with the package, both the A and the B, as well as a whole plethora of liveries included as well with the product. And on top of that, as we've seen, once again, you get the USS Forrestal included as well, which again, hats off to the devs on that one. Most devs, I'm sure, would not have included the carrier as part of the package. It's worth noting as well that the aircraft is carrier capable out of the box, albeit the implementation is fairly simplistic. So an absolute ton of features overall, really the only feature that was missing that I was hoping to see. No visible avatar from the pilot seat, which is a feature I really like in DCS. I think it really ramps up the immersion, particularly in VR. So it would be really nice if we can perhaps see that added at a later date. As far as the included documentation goes, that is one aspect of the product, which is rather lackluster. Included, you get a quick start guide, which essentially runs you through the differences between this version of the aircraft and the DCS version of the aircraft. It also runs you through a few of the differences between the Microsoft Flight Simulator version and the real thing. On top of that, you do also get the quote unquote aircraft manual, but that's actually an even thinner document than the quick start guide. That document basically just gives you a few details regarding the F-14, a few pictures of the panel layout as well. So the devs really relying on you to either make use of a DCS manual, or apparently as well, they're even considering the fact you might use the real world NatOps manual. Obviously you can get away with either of those, but it would have been nice to have a proper set of documentation included with the aircraft. The documentation for me though is really one of my only major negatives, just a couple of things that also stood out. You are limited in terms of the number of times you can download the product, only three downloads available. I've mentioned it before, I realise why it's done, but I don't like the fact that you purchase a product and the dev then dictates to you how many times you can download it. Of course, I'm sure if you get in touch with Indiefox Techo or Heat Blur Simulations, they'll reactivate your downloads if needs be. Another really nice touch, Heat Blur Simulations actually offers a discount on the product if you've purchased the DCS version of the aircraft previously. I believe it's a 25% discount, so not to be sniffed at and very generous of them, of course. It is just worth noting though on that one, it's a manual process. I'm still waiting on my email at the moment. So if you want to purchase the aircraft in a hurry, then you might get a little bit frustrated whilst you're waiting around. Lastly, in terms of the aircraft FPS, I was getting around 50 FPS in the F-14 Tomcat versus around 70 FPS under the same scenario with the default Cessna 152. In short then, once again, I think that this collaboration between India Fox Techo and Heat Blur is an absolute triumph within Microsoft Flight Simulator. If you are looking for a highly accurate flight model, weapon systems, combat, everything of that nature, then again, DCS is your better bet. But if you're a big fan of the Tomcat, you love Microsoft Flight Simulator, and you want the world to explore in the aircraft, this one is an absolutely superb option. One of the prettiest add-ons that I've seen in any sim, and also one of the best add-ons that I've come across for really bringing an aircraft alive. 
Once again guys, I do hope you found the video interesting and to be of use. If you did, then please consider giving it a like. If you want to see more content from the channel, then please consider subscribing as well. And if you'd like to help support the channel further, you can do so by becoming a channel member or patron. I'll leave a link to both of those down in the video description below. Once again, I do hope you're having a great day wherever you are. Take really good care and I will see you all again soon.